с 25-летием. В последнее время все чаще мы употребляем формулу четыре кампуса, один университет. We use now to, uh, uh, the formula uh, four campuses, one uh, university. Um, Смысл заключается в том, что э, мы работаем по единым стандартам, у нас э, единые подходы, но э, в каждом городе, Москва, Санкт-Петербург, Перм и Нижний Новгород, есть своя специфика. Эта uh, формула means that we work following the same standards, the same approaches, but uh, in any case, in many cities we are, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Um, and Nizhny Novgorod, there is uh, uh, the specificity of uh, each region, if each city and uh, each campus. I думаю, что конференция, которая которая организована в эти дни на базе кампуса в Нижнем Новгороде, прекрасно иллюстрирует эту формулу. Um, I'm sure that uh, the conference uh, organized uh, uh, on these days in Nizhny Novgorod perfectly illustrates this formula. Uh, с одной стороны, uh, тема конференции и um, акцент на культурный трансфер действительно прекрасно отражает специфику uh, Нижнего Новгорода и uh, региона. On one hand, uh, the central team of the conference, the cultural transfer, exactly uh, reflects, perfectly reflects the specificity of Nizhny Novgorod and uh, its region. С другой стороны, тот уровень, на котором проводится конференция, прекрасно отражает те высокие стандарты высшей школы экономики, которым мы все следуем. On the other hand, uh, the standards, standards and the level of uh, the conference perfectly reflects also high standards of our university. Um, first of all, uh, the excellent, the presence of excellent speakers and researchers. Прежде всего, я имею в виду высочайший уровень спикеров и исследователей, которые участвуют в этой конференции. Second point, Uh, of course, uh, is, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, his, it's international character. Второе, это, безусловно, международный характер конференции. The conference, uh, which uh, gathers uh, researchers from different, not only from different countries, uh, but also from different parts of the world. Uh, конференция, которая собрала не только участников из разных стран, но буквально из разных частей света. Uh, я с большим удовольствием приветствую также представителей uh, посольств uh, Франции и uh, Австрии, которые участвуют в этой конференции и в нашем сегодняшнем пленарном заседании. It's my big pleasure to greet also uh, representatives of uh, embassies of France and Austria who uh, take part in uh, our plenary session today. И, uh, наконец, uh, очень важный элемент, который отличает нашу, наш университет, uh, несмотря на историческое название Высшей школы экономики, это междисциплинарность. And finally, the third point, um, which is characteristic for our university, despite its uh, historical name, High School of Economics, uh, the interdisciplinarity of the conference. Культурный uh, трансфер, безусловно, это категория, это концепт, который появился в сфере гуманитарных наук, но сегодня который, концепт, который затрагивает самые различные сферы исследований, и в этом, я думаю, мы убедимся в течение этих дней. The cultural transfer. Uh, first of all, in the field of uh, uh, humanities, now uh, offers different possibilities to uh, other fields of studies, and uh, I am sure uh, during all these days we'll see how it works in different fields of research. Я хотел бы поздравить организаторов конференции, 
Нижегородский кампус с, я уверен, успехом и пожелать всего самого наилучшего. I would like to uh, greet once again organizers of the conference, uh, Nizhny Novgorod campus of HEC, with a successful conference. I'm sure it will be a big success. And uh, I would like to wish you all the best. Uh, alles Gute, plein succès, всего самого хорошего. Thank you, спасибо. Thank you, Ivan Valerievich, for this warm address and outlining the main directions and challenges of the formation of human capital that can develop the future of our country and actually not only our country but all all the countries in the world and for highlighting the role of universities in the process of upbringing of actors for cultural transfer and now i invite olga petrova minister of education of the nizhny novgorod region with a welcoming message to the conference participants. Olga Viktorovna. Доброе утро. Я так понимаю, что надо на двух языках, да, приветствовать, судя Any... по настрою конференции. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you at our conference. And it's a really a great pleasure for our city, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, in the year of uh, its anniversary, we celebrated 800 years. And it's a great pleasure also for our campus um, of High School of Economics and our, in our city, which also celebrates uh, anniversary, not such a high, big anniversary as the city, but 25 years, it's a great date that, shows uh, that our campus is one of uh, the biggest actually among our other universities in the city and uh, the topic that uh, we have uh, for this conference is also quite important for our city because um, as I already told about the celebration, and it was also a year of a lot of cultural activities and creative industries appeared in our city and they became really a new way and new direction of our city. Добро пожаловать к нам. С большим удовольствием приветствую всех участников. В год 800-летия это для нас очень приятно. И особенно приятно, что в этом году и филиал Высшей школы экономики, который в нашем регионе занимает позицию как один из ведущих вузов и имеет большое количество студентов и становится все более и более активным и наращивает свою активность во всех сферах деятельности и консультационной, и в плане экспертной, и в большой работе с, с сообществом во всех направлениях деятельности. И очень приятно, что тема этой конференции, которую мы проводим, это культурный трансфер, формирование созидательного человеческого капитала, потому что год и празднование стартовало в нашем регионе направление новой индустрии, креативной индустрии, много было создано пространств, и это на повестке и нашего региона, и наш губернатор Глеб Сергеевич тоже сейчас активно дал старт этому развитию. Поэтому видеть такое большое количество спикеров, международных спикеров, к сожалению, или, может быть, к радости в зум-пространстве, потому что большее количество сможет участвовать, очень приятно. And, uh, it's a pleasure that uh, th maybe this conference uh, goes in a Zoom uh, format, because uh, more participants can uh, take part in the conference and I hope very much that in some years all of uh, you will have the possibility to visit our city because the city was changed a lot and it's really one of the capital of our 
country, the third capital, as we usually say. И я надеюсь, что у всех будет возможность когда-то приехать в Нижний Новгород и познакомиться с нашим городом, который мы рассматриваем как одна из столиц России, третья столица, потому что много создано новых пространств. И я желаю успеха конференции, потому что это то место, где создаются всегда новые мысли, новые идеи, хорошего коммуни... коммуникации, несмотря на какие-то ограничения, что нельзя продолжить той фразы, как сейчас мы слышали, а теперь пойдемте и приступим к фуршету, но я думаю, что фуршет будет у всех в таком формате на своих местах. Всем желаю удачи успехов и пусть у нас все получится. So I wish uh, success to the conference and maybe it's a bit pity that um, we uh, could not finalize with the word that now we have a small foreshad for everybody but I hope that all of you will take pleasure of all the activities that will, will go on on uh, this uh, Zoom conference of high school of economics thank you very much thank you olga Viktorovna, for this warm and inspiring for our hearts words you know our campus would further and not only our campus you know all the campuses of uh, uh, the high school of economics uh, would further closely collaborate with the minister of education on different aspects of the creative human capital development. Thank you. And now I ask Herr Fabian Ortler, Director of the Austrian Cultural Forum in Moscow and Cultural Attaché of the Embassy of the Austrian Republic in the Russian Federation. You're welcome, Herr Ortler. Thank you, sir. Um, sehr geehrte Ehrengäste, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde, erlauben Sie mir meine Grußworte auf Englisch heute anzurichten. Уважаемые почетные гости, уважаемые дамы и господа, дорогие друзья, позвольте мне обратиться к вам с приветствием на английском языке. Distinguished guests of honor, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, let me first of all congratulate you on the one hand on the 800th anniversary of the city of Nizhny Novgorod, the 25th anniversary of the HEC campus, and on the other hand, on the successful organization of this high-level conference. I'm very pleased to be able to speak to you today and to attend this event mm -hmm. together with you, even though it's in the virtual format. I personally find the title of this conference uh, very appealing, especially uh, the world, the world uh, cultural transfer. Without getting into discussion with you about <laughs> content, uh, I would rather like to address and to focus on the semantics of this word. Transfer comes from the Latin word transfer, to bring from one place to another. And um, every transfer from one context to another leads also to its transformation of the meaning by itself, uh, culturally, historically, and also scientifically. And I think this is what this conference is about, because this conference will examine the background and the numerous facets of transfer in art, in the culture, and also in literature. The thematic restriction to Austria, Russia, and France seems highly suitable to me because you cannot cover everything in a conference. And this topic is already a broad topic. And therefore, I think, as I said, it's highly suitable thematic restriction. Um, let me also address the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the thing that we are today meeting in the, uh, as I said, virtual format, I think we're all victims of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's precisely such a conference, to my opinion, that shows also the advantages of the new technical possibilities we have all learned to handle in the last year. This highly complex transfer of knowledge and more generally of uh, human capital 
is more probably is is probably more possible today than it was ever before. And um, as as the speakers before me also said already, <coughs> together such an interesting and rich group of different people from all over the world would is one maybe one of the, the, the benefits also of the pandemic and of the new technical possibilities we all have. Without taking up any more of your time, I wish you an instructive conference and all the best. Please also take care of yourself and I thank you very much for your attention. Brigitte Sibia, спасибо за ваше внимание. Passen Sie auf sich auf und vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you, Herr Ortner. We have broad cultural relations with many agencies in your country. And it's not accidental that the Austrian Library, which is actually an Austrian cultural center, operates on our campus. Thank you. Mesdames et Messieurs, et maintenant je passe la parole à Monsieur Gilles Bametz, conseiller de coopération et d'action culturelle adjoint de l'Ambassade de France à Russie et directeur délégué de l'Institut français de Russie qui va prononcer un discours de bienvenue aux participants de la conférence. Je vous en prie, Monsieur Mametz. Merci, merci, cher, cher Gennady. Euh, mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis, dames et gaspada, dragi et euh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear friends, euh, Dear Olga Petrovna, dear Gennady Ryabov, dear Ivan Prostakov, dear Fabian Ortner, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm really pleased to be one of yours because uh, the celebration of this 25th anniversary means a lot for a French embassy. Um, we, we all know that the, the exchanges between France and the high school of economy are really, really important. And uh, I'm really pleased to see that one of my compatriots was uh, one of the main guests uh, for the, this, uh, this conference. Uh, indeed, the, the topic of the, uh, the open conference that uh, Mr. Michel Espagne will give is really important. The, the model of cultural transfer, some Russian case studies. And I was really, really interested uh, in um, underlining the, the, the fact that the word fourchette is a perfect illustration of cultural transfers between, between France and Russia, because <laughs> the word fourchette means fork <laughs> or vilke. Uh, but uh, for any French people, it means buffet. Uh, so it's one of the examples of the, the dynamics of cultural exchange be between France and, and, and Russia. And we do hope that we will foster these exchanges more and more. So um, the, the, the presence of uh, Mr. Michel Espagne is really uh, precious because we all know the meaning for uh, French research of the National Scientific Research Center. And uh, it's a uh, um, an illustration of the, the the quality that prevails in the in the the, the high school of economics, and uh, indeed twenty fifth anniversary, it's uh, it's a young age, but it's the perfect perfect moment to get married. So uh, we do hope that this twenty fifth anniversary and this age means will mean more weddings between high school of economics and French universities. We do we do know the, that there are a lot of them, but we you can count on on our support in order to foster this cooperation. And uh, I wish to all of us that the twenty fifth. Anniversary, uh, anniversary will mean a lot of beautiful kids and children uh, between high school and of economics and uh, the French universities. So you can count on, on our support. I wish you all the best. Я, опять же, очень рад быть с вами сегодня. Это первый раз для меня. Я только что приехал и вступил в должность полтора месяца тому назад. И you can you Вы, вы можете быть уверены, что в ближайший месяц я буду в Нижнем Новгороде для того, чтобы познакомиться с вами в реальной жизни, в жизни офлайн, которую мы все желаем. Хорошего дня, хорошего и прекрасной конференции. 
Успехов вам всем. Thank you, Mr. Mamet. Sir, our campus cooperates with several French universities, and we have joint programs with the Alliance Française de Nijni Novgorod. And you know that your interns teach French and culture to our students. And for you personally, anytime, you are welcome to Nijni Novgorod. Ladies and gentlemen, let me, on your behalf, extend deep gratitude to all the welcoming speakers for the warm greetings to the conference attendees and for their wishes of fruitful work. And now we switch over to the plenary session discussions and I'm pleased to yield the floor to a co-chair of the planning committee, Professor Valeria Sussman, who will moderate the plenary session and introduce the keynote speakers. Thanks to everybody. Valeri, take up, please. And now the conference is in your hand. Uh, thank you, Gennady Ryabov. I, in turn, give the floor to the co-chair of our conference, Ivan Prostokov, who will int introduce the first plenary session speaker, please. Спасибо, uh, Valeri Georgievich. Thank you, Valeri Georgievich. Для меня э, было большой честью и радостью, когда э, организаторы предложили представить Фуада Тагиевича Рискерова. For me, it was a big pleasure and a big honor when organizers asked to uh, introduce and to moderate uh, the session with uh, Фуад uh, Рискеров. Um, профессор Рискеров. Uh, Математик, выдающийся математик, специалист в области теории принятия решений и теории игр. Профессор Искев, great mathematician and specialist in the field of uh, game theory and the decision making. Um, профессор Искев, uh, руководитель Департамента математики на факультете экономических наук нашего университета, заведующий международным центром анализа и выбора решений. Профессор Лискеров is the head of the Department of Mathematics for Economics at our university, head of International Center of Decision Analysis and Choice, член Европейской академии, member of Academia Europea, uh, after 11 monographies and sotin статей, uh, he's a, uh, the author of uh, 11 books and hundreds uh, of articles. И продолжение его регалий, его заслуг, академических заслуг займет очень много времени. Um, if I have to list all awards, all prizes, and all positions of Professor Alice Karoff, it will take a lot of time. Но чтобы все это сконцентрировать и выбросить, выбрать и выразить одним словом или несколькими словами, я бы сказал, что профессор Алис Кедров это амбассадор нашего университета. But uh, if uh, I have to express all this in one word or a few words, I would say that Professor Skerov is uh, the ambassador of our university. Говорить о том, что он математик, экономист, этого совершенно недостаточно. To say that uh, he's a mathematician or economist, it's not enough. Профессор uh, Алискеров uh, удивительным образом um, открыт для самых различных отраслей знания, в которых uh, применяется математический аппарат. Профессор Алискеров is open to uh, different fields of knowledge where, uh, the, where mathematics is possible to apply mathematics and uh, all its uh, tools. Подумайте только, что он работает в 30 областях знаний. Imagine that uh, he works in 
30 fields of research and studies. И когда мы говорим математика, экономика, для неискушенного человека это может показаться очень узким, очень сухим. When we say mathematics or economics, for many people it seems very limited. Но на самом деле это необычайное богатство, которым располагает Фуат Тагиевич и которым он с нами поделится. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, Professor Eskerv owns uh, an incredible treasure and uh, he will share it with us. Uh, он поделится им с нами, потому что uh, помимо своих профессиональных заслуг и высокого профессионального уровня, это замечательный человек. Uh, he will share it with us not only because he's an excellent researcher, professional, uh, but because uh, he's an incredible uh, man, incredible person. Сегодня в конференции будет принимать участие также Нобелевский лауреат Эрик Маскин, друг профессора Рискерова. In today's session later will participate also Professor Eric Maskin, Nobel Prize and friend of Professor Рискерова. Совсем недавно он принимал участие в марафоне Новое знание, которое было организовано 1 сентября обществом знания в России. Recently uh, he participated, Professor Maskin participated uh, to so-called uh, marathon new knowledge organized by the uh, Russian society knowledge знания. Uh, он встречался с uh, российскими школьниками, uh, с детьми. Uh, he met uh, uh, pupils from Russian schools, children. И uh, один из uh, ребят uh, спросил у профессора Маскина, который является также uh, исследователем в нашем университете, в высшей школе экономики, как вы пришли в высшую школу экономики. Uh, one of uh, participants, of young participants to the marathon asked professor uh, Maskin uh, how Uh, did you decide to how it, did you decide to uh, join uh, high school of economics? Uh, ответ был удивительным. Uh, the answer was uh, incredibly wonderful. Uh, он сказал, что в науке, uh, как и в жизни, всегда очень большую роль играют человеческие отношения. Uh, he said that in science and research, as uh, in all our life, uh, the crucial point is uh, relations between humans. Uh, он хорошо знает профессора Рискирова. Он его знает с профессиональной точки зрения, с человеческой точки зрения. He knows uh, very well Professor Riskerov, uh, his friend. And as researcher. И uh, для него именно приглашение профессора Рискирова в высшую школу экономики сыграло решающую роль. And uh, for him, for his decision to join HCC uh, was the invitation of professor Рискиров. Я думаю, что uh, вот эта деталь, она uh, говорит очень многое. И очень здорово дополняет тот список заслуг, которые есть у профессора Рискирова в профессиональной деятельности. Uh, it seems to me that these small details, detail, complete very well the portrait of uh, Professor Рискиров and uh, complete all lists of his uh, uh, incredible, successful uh, professional career. So, uh, Professor Рискиров, the floor is yours. Professor Riskerov, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 after these very warm words, the end should be uh, now you shouldn't work, you go and enjoy rest. Uh, but uh, I'm really very pleased for an invitation uh, 
to this very conference. And first time I was in Nizhny Novgorod in 1969 uh, or 68 even. Uh, and f from that time I uh, visited this very nice city many times. Unfortunately, for the last two years, I couldn't uh, go because of this virus. I have a, a lot of nice friends there, co-authors, and uh, we work together. And I enjoyed very much uh, all my visits to Nizhny, very nice city. And I strongly recommend everybody who didn't go there to do it. Uh, uh, and just uh, the day uh, before yesterday, I wrote a letter to, to, uh, to another my friend in the States. Uh, and uh, uh, he would like to come to our April conference uh, next year. And I told him that maybe it is worth going to Nizhny Novgorod and give lecture and enjoy the city. Okay, so congratulations again with the anniversary of the city and the anniversary of the branch. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, should I translate myself to Russian? Uh, no, okay, thanks. So, but and today uh, I will talk about a bit um, uh, political uh, kind of political theory. As uh, you, uh, Professor Prostakov said, I did a lot of work, uh, different works in different fields, but um, generally you understand that it is all based on mass. Uh, so, and today I will talk about the polarization of the society and patterns of electoral behavior. Uh, now this very uh, topic be is becoming more and more important. Um, just very recently, very I can say a couple of weeks ago, the Professor Maris Abstrud's uh, article was published in Contemporary Economic Policy about the globalization now, and especially with under the crisis leads to um, the nationalization, uh, nationalism in uh, relations. And uh, I would like now to discuss situation to which extent you see this uh, after this works by Professor uh, Michel Espagne, which uh, really you see, uh, I read and was very surprised, positively surprised, enjoyed very much with the ideas. And uh, I, I would like to say that uh, unfortunately, we uh, often uh, observe a bit different uh, attitude, a bit different relation. And this is a, a, a citation I wrote an article after this 9-11 event. Uh, uh, it was published in uh, several Russian journals and uh, also at the West, it was translated. Uh, uh, and this is just a citation there in the center of Europe and Belgium, European Arabic League demand official interruption of integration of immigrant Muslims into Belgian life, you see. And this is a citation. And then uh, you see, I started to think about it, especially for this last years when we have really a, a rather high increase of the uh, migration process uh, from Africa, from the East, uh, Middle East uh, to Europe, I started to think about what kind of uh, motivations, what kind of uh, problems it might create and uh, to and came to some main concerns, which is, which are first the communities itself today, you see, and even a few years ago, there were uh, very heterogeneous themselves, as you see. Uh, on the other hand, we have this heterogeneity of migrants and the, this migration, immigration process uh, is defined by the demand on the job market and we should not uh, escape uh, in our studies the very idea of polarization which might be in this uh, very situation. So 
just not, uh, I will not write formulas here, uh, but the idea is very simple. You see, suppose we have a left right scale in which you see these are positions, let's say, of uh, groups of population. This is a uh, far left and this is far right. And suppose that all of our uh, population is distributed rather equally over this all topics uh, over all these views, spectrum of views. And naturally we understand that the uh, polarization in this very society will be very low. The lowest polarization naturally will be in the case when a all population is concentrated in one point. It, it doesn't matter where is it, this one point on the high, um, far left or far right. And the highest polarization will be naturally if we have this very situation when the part of population is concentrated in the uh, uh, left, leftist views and uh, half of the population is concentrated on the rightist views. So uh, what is the idea you see to understand that suppose we have a settlements with initial distribution of population in it we have in, then we have initial polarization then migrants come with their own distribution of polarization yes and polarization in the settlements will, will change and uh, allocation of migrants to this very uh, settlements should take into account this very uh, point of polarization. And so uh, I uh, present here rather simple uh, artificial data. Suppose we have a uh, settlement, some settlement with very, and only three types of views some kind of centrist, uh, leftist and right, right views, left and right. We have very few people in left and right and more in uh, uh, right views, almost 100%, you see, and very few here. And then the initial uh, percent of polarization will be very low. According to that very picture which I showed you, Again, I don't like to write formulas, but if somebody will be interested in, I have it in the uh, appendix to this very topic. And suppose migrants will come to this very settlement and their views are more centrist, okay? Then we can see that initial distribution of population was like this, now people came here, this is a distribution of migrants, and polarization will go very high in this very settlement. Initial was almost zero, now it came near to 100%. And if we have, again, you see artificial example, suppose we have 22 settlements, with this very distribution of views over three different kind, uh, types of views, you see. These are just artificially, <coughs> sorry, generated numbers. So many people in this very uh, settlements, 22 settlements belong to the, let's say, leftist view, very few uh, to the uh, center and a bit more to the uh, right views, and these are initial polarization. Oops, sorry. Uh, you can see here that usually it is very low, except of few cases, for instance, in this very C, we have 614 people here, 83 and 85 here. So, and suppose 11 groups of migrants will come to this very uh, uh, let's say country or region, uh, 11 groups of migrants with this kind of distribution of views. You see, mainly uh, with the views on the level A, left views, only two people in group 11 uh, and in group five, more in this uh, B view and more, uh, even more in the uh, rightest view C. 
then we can evaluate in this very polarization, you see, and this index of polarization, which I introduced some years ago, uh, was, uh, it is evaluated between zero and one. One is the highest polarization and zero is lowest. So we have initial distribution uh, <clears throat> above level 0 0.4, only four, and then uh, and above level 0 0.7, uh, which is really very high, zero settlements. And if we allocate these very migrants in the settlements uh, without taking into account this very uh, views in the settlements, we might have 11, uh, now 11 um, settlements with the polarization level above 0 0.4 and three, even three with the level above uh, the level 0 0.7. In a good uh, allocation of uh, migrants, we might have the previous situation, you see, that is taking into account the initial situation in the settlements. Now I would like to go and uh, tell just a few words of another problem, serious problem, which really uh, influenced our world. Uh, recently, last year, we published an article in one of the top journals uh, about this um, network analysis of terrorism. And uh, you see, I never worked on this very topic. And since we um, provide, um, proposed a new model of network analysis, I said to my students that why not to analyze, maybe you uh, you find the data and we analyze terroristic groups there. Uh, and it, in my you see, mind, I had that only 9-11 was a really great uh, event, you see, tragic event with a lot of people. Um, Died. It turned out that from 2001 to 2016, there were 83,000 plus terroristic attacks and more than 111,000 victims over these attacks. And we studied this very uh, indices uh, of uh, new indices. Again, I will not go to the mathematical details. You see, we created very advanced theory on this. Uh, but I would like to attract your attention to another thing. You see, 2001, 2004, these are terrorist groups who uh, uh, managed to have some attacks in different uh, parts of the world. And you see that they are almost not very well connected, you see, they are separate. And 2014, 2016, uh, there is much more, first of all, there are more groups and they are much uh, more connected uh, uh, comparing with the previous situation. And this is for 2014, 2016. And in this very case, we uh, evaluated for this very case, there are different components and we evaluated with respect to the number of victims and number of attacks we had, uh, we evaluated the influence of these very groups. And uh, first group contained 253 groups. And this is the places where they are active. Um, here are uh, their views, and these are the number of victims uh, just of these 253 groups. And here we can see the third component of this very network. These are mainly ecologist groups, leftist and anarchist ecologist group, with only one victim all over these years. And naturally, it is clear that it, it was a, some kind of accident. So uh, um, this, when I wrote that very article after 9-11, I uh, um, 
discussed the situation which was introduced by a great American economist, Jim Buchanan, with his uh, PhD student about this uh, dual uh, model of um, uh, tragedy of commons. Uh, I would like to just in a few words explain you in the tragedy of commons, it's a classic uh, um, idea which goes back to uh, John Stuart Mill, as far as I remember, and David Hume. Uh, the, the very idea was the following, you see, if you allow to use common resources without any control, these resources, due to the, in a sense, rational behavior, but individualistic behavior of every person, this resource will be exhausted very soon, you see. The dual version, which was discuss, uh, discussed and discovered by Jim Buchanan, I, I met him uh, several times uh, in America years ago. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away, but uh, 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 his very idea was the following, you see, if we have a common resources and many groups which might block using these resources to, uh, which might block the use of these resources independently, this, then this resource will be underused, you see. This is so-called, I called it, uh, uh, it's an idea of where to group, you see, every every group might where to the situation, but I called it the dual version of uh, tragedy of commons. And now I would like to switch to Maslow's pyramid. We know that this is very, famous work in sociology of uh, first published in 1940s, uh, 1944, as far as I remember, that uh, I would not, I don't like to go to all, through all this pyramid, but uh, she separated some kind of uh, physiological sort of needs, uh, which is food, water, etc., shelter, uh, and second level is the safety needs. You see, if we have this uh, physiological needs satisfied, then the next level which comes to our um, concern, you see, and this is very important, is the safety needs. And what I would like to say is that uh, I've, uh, that it looks like today the model of polarization really, you see, influences the uh, situation on the political uh, electoral behavior. That in the case when we, the cause of polarization is inequality, war, etc., people move to the left part of the scale. Uh, asking for equality, equal rights, you see, equal uh, income, etc., etc. But if this very polarization, as we see before, might be a threat of the destruction of the basic values, basic, really basic uh, values of the society, then people move to the right, and then we see this very growing of nationalism, growing of um, uh, right scale views, etc. And we uh, observe this kind of situation in Europe. And I gave a talk uh, um, two years ago, uh, in it was one of my last trips in at the autumn of 1919, the um, uh, meeting was organized, the conference in Prague by European Union, and I was invited to give a plenary talk about the democracy, and it, it was called, the conference was called Democracy in 21st uh, Century. And uh, I gave this very talk and was this uh, very ideas were accepted uh, rather with very high interest. Uh, 
Thank you very much. I would like to stop here and respond to your questions, if I may. Uh, but if you are interested in this mathematical foundations of these very models, uh, I, I can show you immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Iskerov. Uh, um, probably there are some questions. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, I have one. Uh, going back to the theme, the main topic of the conference, do you think that uh, there is a connection between uh, polarization of the society and uh, some aspects of uh, cultural transfer? Yeah, that is, uh, I didn't uh, uh, explain it to. Uh, widely, but that, that is my idea, you see. The higher is the polarization, the lower is the possibility of cultural transfer. That is the story, you see. That is the very idea of the the very core understanding of the situation, you see. If these groups consider that their basic values might be distorted, understand then uh, there is a, some kind of wall is constructed between these groups that is the story okay i don't see any question uh, in the chat mm, uh, yes i see the hands uh, raised by professor zusman please thank you very much Влад Тагиевич, большое спасибо за очень интересный доклад. Скажите, пожалуйста, как соотносится понятие поляризации с сетевой структуры вот современного мира? Uh, how the polarization and the network structure of the modern society stand together? Yeah, that is another story I can, <laughs> I can talk about it. You see, last year in uh, Sorbonne, I gave uh, lectures on network analysis uh, of uh, these very new models we, which we gave, uh, which I uh, proposed for, for last few years. You see, um, this is uh, another story, you see, and we might see on this very... Um, network structures, to which extent these groups are either connected or disconnected, you see. And uh, in this very disconnected situations to analyze this important players of, uh, important players of the uh, system uh, is very important, you see, to understand who plays a crucial role in this very communications. So there is a whole series on this uh, uh, we, we developed for the last few years and we applied it to migration um, uh, processes for uh, world trade, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in this very sense, uh, polarization of views might in some naturally in some uh, today in some cases might influence uh, really communication in, uh, in this very uh, societies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, another, another Professor, Espa Professor Espine, mm. first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much. A uh, uh, small question. Uh, do you think that uh, polar polarization uh, may depend on the cultural environment? Or uh, do, you, uh, do you think uh, polar polarization may be uh, a model for all culture uh, for the world? Uh, first of all, uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to meet you uh, even in Zoom in this very conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is uh, another story, another part of the story. Polarization, from my point of view, Professor Spine, uh, uh, this um, 
let me tell you in that way. You see, I wrote about, about it a few words in my that article about terrorism. To which extent this very, um, let's say, basic views of the society, never mind on which it is based, on religious uh, um, uh, values or some other values, social values, never mind, you see. These very basic views might create really some kind non, of non-confidence, you see, which might prevent this very communication and um, the exchange, let's say, uh, what, what we would prefer to have an exchange of really positive values, you see, between societies. But this might be the case, yes. Yes, please, Professor Kalagin. Are there um, some connections between polarization and uh, possible social troubles, revolutions, something like this? Well, uh, in fact, you see, uh, we didn't go to that far away, you see, uh, because we did uh, some work on a history of uh, uh, Weimar Republic uh, uh, par Parliament, uh, Weimar Reichstag, and we saw how this very, uh, let's say, impossibility of two centrist or leftist groups to go to the uh, co um, coalition, mm -hmm. they open, pave the way for Hitler, you see. And uh, at that time, I read a lot of uh, articles about it. It was really, for me, it was really depressive thing that this very things, uh, uh, this very inability to go and to listen to each other, you see, to pave the way to and change the whole uh, history of the world, you see. Uh, so, uh, but going back to this polarization and revolution, I rem remember when it was open during the uh, some materials of World War the First. I was so surprised that it was a letter of Russian soldier to his family from the uh, 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 battle, you see, battle uh, region. He wrote that uh, it is so, uh, we are so upset to be here, you see, we don't know what for we are fighting, what we are fighting for and Maybe it will be better for Germans to come and get everything. Can you imagine a Russian person writing such words, you see? This means that they really came to some, the dead point, you see. Uh, and uh, that was really very, very surprising, you see, for me. And maybe it is worth studying, you see. But I'm not a historian, although I have some works in history, but uh, it, it is necessary for some historian to work with some historian to, to explain all these things. But it was really, really it's a great surprise for me, such letter when I saw it. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question in the chat uh, for the year, which I will translate it. Um, Professor Liskaev, uh, good. Um, good morning. Thank you for this uh, interesting lecture. Uh, the question is, uh, um, could uh, the introduction of new parameters uh, such as uh, education or standard of living uh, change uh, the curve uh, uh, on the last graph? Yeah, that's a correct question. In fact, you see, it is really, you see, might uh, make it more smooth. But I would like to remind that when I wrote or, or drew that very curve, you see, I talk about the basic values, you see. When some basic values of mine, you see, I understand that they are under pressure, under destruction. In this case, I will forget about my education, about my standards of life, you see. I don't like this standard, uh, this my basic values will be destroyed by some other people or whatever, you see, that is very important. Although the 
Mm, you see, this is very interesting. Uh, That's very important question, really. You see, uh, analyzing again this Weimar uh, period, uh, I always ask myself a question: How it was possible in Germany to have this very situation? You see, one of the most culturally advanced uh, states in the uh, in Europe from centuries. You see, during centuries, and then answer which I gave to myself was that it was a uh, more than 20 years absence of education, you see. This is World War the Second, then this very period of uh, hyperinflation when they didn't get any money, everybody thought about it. So this very 30 something, uh, no, 20 years changed the whole uh, society. And then uh, you understand that this very basic values, you see, after this very, let's say, um, pressures, that this very uh, situations might be changed, really. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't see any other question and uh, I'm sorry. Mikhail Kirillin, please. Thank you. If we have a, a time also for a small question. Uh, so uh, I was also very excited about the last graph uh, you told. And uh, uh, my question is uh, whether there is some data on the evolution of this graph uh, in times of revolutions or, and so on. So is there any, like, I don't know, statistical data or so on, how it evolves depending on the situation in country? for somebody, I don't know, for Weimar Republic or maybe for the end of USSR or something like that. Uh, thank you very much. You see, no, uh, we did not, uh, again, you see, I need some colleagues who will work with me, you see, I don't know so well history, for instance, I yes, well, I read history of uh, Weimar Republic. Generally, I know the history of Europe, etc. but you see, I don't know at that way the levels that, to give some kind of, you see, uh, comments. Uh, you see, this is a, a, a work of historians, you see, and I will be happy to work together with historians to create such kind of models, etc. But uh, no, we didn't do it, you see. We didn't do it. But generally, you see, as I gave you this very example from uh, Russian uh, before revolution, World War the First. Uh, it is understandable that you see people, people you see, so were so tired of this, the war which they did not understand very well. You see that they were uh, absolutely uh, agree for the invasion of Germans. You see occupation, etc. First World War. You see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Risker. Thank you all. Uh, thank we you have to, to finish, uh, to be in time. And uh, in any case, I suppose that uh, all questions raised uh, may help uh, uh, to all of us to understand better um, uh, the ideas of Professor Risker. And on the other hand, probably, uh, it will be also a kind of stimulus for your further uh, researches. In any case, it was a fantastic lecture. Thank you. And I'm very glad to pass the button to Professor Sussman to introduce uh, uh, the, another excellent uh, speaker. Uh, I would say even the guest star of, of the conference and the uh, reason is very simple and you, Professor Sussman, will explain it, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan Thank you, uh, For Tagievich, большое спасибо за ваш исключительно интересный и содержательный доклад для меня лично как слушателя, поставивший вопрос о границах, о пределах рациональности. Thank you so much, Professor Alexkerov, uh, for your uh, lecture concerning, in my opinion, the problem of the limits of rationality. And uh, now I'm very glad to present our next speaker, Dr. Michel Espagne from Paris, 
he will make a presentation on the model of cultural transfer, some Russian case studies. Michel Espagne is known as one of the founders of the theory of cultural transfer, a well-known cultural historian and bright Germanist. Among the numerous publications of our guest, the famous scientist, I would like to single out one in Russian excellent translation edited by Yekaterina Dmitrieva from the Institute of World Literature in Moscow. The title of the book, History of Civilizations as a Cultural Transfer, convincingly testifies to the breadth of the author's scientific horizon. The book, includes two monographs by Monsieur Espagne, Franco German Cultural Transfer and History of Art as a Cultural Transfer, the way of Anton Springer. I'm, I'm very happy that Michel Espagne is today with us and a couple of words in, in Russian. Представляя нашего гостя, мне хотелось бы сказать, что Мишель Испань – один из создателей теории культурного трансфера, который в значительной мере посвящена нашей конференции. Не только известный историк, историк культуры и германист, но и, несомненно, ученый, разработавший целый ряд ключевых положений. И вот несколько изменяя сейчас характер того, что я пытался сказать по-английски, я хотел бы отметить только два момента. Это междисциплинарность как основу культурного трансфера, потому что э, культурный тр трансфер, я цитирую, Мишель Испания связан с переосмыслением границ, сложившихся между их дисциплинами и переоценкой их иерархии. Это важнейшее положение. И еще одна идея, очень, на мой взгляд, интересная. Нет отдельных историй у отдельных явлений и отдельных культур и отдельных регионов. Есть перекрестная история. Истуар Круазма – это исключительно эвристичное и яркое положение. Мишель Испан, dear Мишель, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Valérie. I'm very grateful uh, to the organizers and uh, uh, especially uh, to Valerie Zussmann um, as, uh, for, for, for his introduction uh, to uh, my presentation. It's a, a great pleasure for me uh, to be uh, in Nizhny Novgorod today, even if uh, I am just uh, virtually present in Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, the title of our presentation uh, is the model of cultural transfer and some Russian case studies. Uh, I try to, to find the second slide, okay. Uh, any movement of a cultural object from one context into another results in a transformation of its meaning, a, a dynamic of re-semantization that we can fully recognize only by taking account of the historical vectors of the transfer. We can therefore say without hesitation that research dealing with cultural transfers concerns most of the human sciences, even though its development involved a certain number of precise points of anchorage. To go beyond this minimalistic definition requires closing a certain number of false leads that the meaning of the term itself could seem to imply. To transfer is not to transport, but rather to metamorphose and the term cannot by any means be reduced to the poorly circumscribed and very banal question of cultural exchanges. It's not so much the circulation of cultural goods as a reinterpretation that is in question. The notion of cultural transfer was created in the context of the study of 19th century Germany or German speaking countries in its connections to France. The reference to Germany was during a large part of the 19th century, a structural element in the history of the human sciences. 
In order to approach this reference, it was necessary on the one hand to take into account the fact that objective knowledge concerning the German cultural field was less important than the reorganization that it could be at the origin of. And on the other hand, that it was necessary to explore the transnational vectors. From this point, we found ourselves placed before research on a hermeneutic nature centered around the determination of new meanings and we face a historical sociological type of inquiry concerning the vectors of transfer between the two countries. Research concerning transfers, how to admit that the appropriation of the cultural object liberates itself from its model, which is to say that the transposition, however far removed from the original it may be, has just as much legitimacy as the model. As a result, the notion of comparison as an additional principle of openness to different spaces in the human and social sciences, lost its relevance and had to be replaced by the observation of forms of cultural mixing and hybridization. The study of cultural transfers obliges us to diminish the relative importance of comparison. Indeed, this letter tends to confront entities in order to tally their resemblances and dissimilarities, but barely takes into account the observer with making the comparison, with opposing in order to reassemble, projecting his own system of categories, creating reductive oppositions, and who himself generally belongs to one of the two terms of the comparison. Being grounded particularly in the comparative grammar of Indo-European languages, comparativism also inherits its limitations. Oh. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, it seems particularly complicated to approach on the basis of comparative history, extra-European territories, and more generally to put into relation territories, cultures, or literatures between which a radical qualitative difference is implicitly presupposed. A recent investigative research on the cultural transfers focused on the presence of a reference to Germany or France in the Russian culture of the 19th and early 20th century. For the last 20 years, work has been undertaken in this area in collaboration with the Institute of Work Literature and Russian colleagues, especially uh, Professor Ekaterina Dmitrieva, that addressed Russian literary history as well as the artistic, philosophical, or even political one in terms of cultural transfers. Since the Middle Ages, a German-Russian has existed. It is as old as a foreigner's neighborhood in Moscow, the Mietzkaya Svoboda. This German population has only grown bigger over the centuries, starting with the colonies of the Volga, which were established at the time of Catherine II, to the Baltic aristocrats serving the Tsar and the many German scientists hosted by the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. During the 18th century, German scholars at the Academy of Sciences were supposed to describe the remote regions of the empire, especially Siberia, to analyze the ethnic composition, the many languages and ethnic groups of Caucasus, and especially Siberia. These German scholars and travelers like Gmelin, Merck, Stella, Reinex, Pallas, and many others contributed to a great extent to define Russian identity. Uh, the identity of uh, the Russian Empire. This Germany outside the boundaries, but at the same time adapted to Russian contexts in which it leaves its mark and is attached to the country of origin, is actually complemented by a more elitist French presence, less profound and limited to the circle of the, of the upper class of the nobility. It resulted in a production of the very extensive literature. As much as the playwright August von Kotzebue contributed to the German theater of St. Petersburg, the publisher of Weitbrecht is part of the history of a city that in 1900 numbered no less than uh, 55,000 German speaking people. Conversely, the Russian writers of St. Petersburg, from Bieli to Mandelstam, involved in their novels an image of Germany. From British Maximilian Klinger to Afanasy Fiet, there are numerous examples of German and Russian writers who works 
whose works may be analyzed in terms of cultural transfers. Russian students in Germany, or more precisely, the Russian followers of neo-Kantianism of Marburg, led to studies on their acquisition of a kind of knowledge which is the origin of their career in Russia. The role played by the University of Göttingen is the training of German teachers who populated in the 19th century the first great Russian universities is well known. The great exploration of Siberia since the 18th century were carried out by German travelers serving the Russian Empire. In the 19th century, France was largely formed on the behalf of German imports. This phenomenon is even more striking for Russia and does not only concern the 19th century, but also part of the 20th century. The German colonies within the Russian Empire are obviously a point of entry for cultural imports. Along the Volga, colonies of farmers settled from Swabia and whose allegiance to the German culture has persisted since the 18th century. Baltic territories dominated by Germany are part of the Russian Empire and in Riga, it Herder himself was conscious of having been a subject of the Tsar. This population was a resource pool of civil service or imperial army administrators. And the case of Maximilian Klinger, the Sturm und Drang poet, reminds us that one could at the same time be official of the court in St. Petersburg and a German writer. Another phenomenon is that of exile. It does not date from the Soviet period, even if from Bunin to Nabokov, an important part of the Russian language literature or written literature by writers initially of Russian mother tongue was originally written abroad. The 19th century was also a period of exile. In the 1830s and 1840s, Prince Meshevsky wrote his collections of poems in French. We think of a Turgenev sharing his time between France and Germany. Of course, exile exists at different levels. Sometimes the exile of Russian aristocrats in the 18th or 19th century was the opportunity to develop the literature of the host country at the same time as weaving a closer link with the Russian context. The circle of Münster, founded by Princess Amalie Galitsin, and where the spiritualist philosopher Jacobi or the poet Stolberg and writer Matthias Claudius spent a lot of time, is one of the major sites of German literary sociability in the late 18th century. Similarly, the Parisian salon of the Baltic princess Juliana of Crudener is a meeting place for representatives of the first French Romanticism. But if the Livonian is a French writer, she retains links with Russia. The Salon of Maria Pavlovna, wife of the Duke of Weimar at the time of Goethe, is obviously one of the scenes of Russian classical German culture. Russian exile is found to be involved in the creation of European intellectual networks until the 20th century, when Kozhev, Kozhevnikov, Gurevich, Koire pass on to the French public knowledge about German philosophy reconsidered under the angle of the Russian Orthodox South. Representations that we can have of Russia's uh, 18th century are due to official paintings, portraits that have fixed for either the features of the aristocracy as well as the salons, genre scenes, families. From uh, 1747, Jakob Stelin becomes director of the Department of Fine Arts at the Academy of St. Petersburg. A colony of foreign artists had settled on the island Vasilyevsky. Hamburg's portraitist Johann Balthasar Frankhardt, for example, painted the features of the Baroness Count Stroganov or the ones of Count Sheremetyev. Ludmila Markina highlighted this phenomenon of German painters in post petrine St. Petersburg in which they transmit the memory to posterity in a book on the painter Georg Ruth. Originally from a family of painters from Württemberg, he lived in Russia since at least uh, 1739 and worked as a court painter, which didn't prevent him from selling paintings and engravings. But it is especially the official portrait of the Empress and of her entourage which made his glory. There is a clear continuity between the portraits of the Württemberg aristocrats drawn before his departure for Russia and the portrait of the imperial court. One could speak of a projection, but in fact, it is mostly a compromise between German painting 
that highlights elements within the bourgeois society, moments of family romance, and the splendor of the court in St. Petersburg. It is indeed a German construction of the Russian memory. Incidentally, it continues in the time. Thus, in the early 19th century, Gerhard von Kugelgen, professor at the Dresden Academy and for a long time court painter in St. Petersburg, painted at the same time portraits of the imperial family, especially for, uh, of the Tsar Alexander, and portraits of the pantheon of German literature, including those of Goethe and Schiller. This example suffices to show the existence of an entangled history that goes against national narratives and closely mingles Germany with Russia, the French-speaking space often appearing in the background as a third party. Certainly, one can always consider that there are distinct entities with multiple bridges which are useful to identify. But it is also conceivable to show osmotic situations such as multiple gradations. That which is a product of cultural area also belongs to the other one. Therefore, we will not highlight as much the bridges, extend the number of examples observed, but highlight the shifts that occur, observe the forms of reinterpretation and adaptation to welcoming context, which result in that Russian culture is built with imported material of a German or French intellectual productions are inexplicable without a Russian background. Certainly, there are translations in the most fundamental re-semantization is that of moving words from one language to those of another. But in the case of the German-Russian network, translation is almost secondary. Russian scientists or writers of the 19th century had an immediate relationship with the literature or with German philosophy and had no need of translation to own it. Moreover, throughout the 19th century, the publication journals of the Academy of Sciences of Russia gladly welcomed texts in German or French. It is probably in the study of implications related to the discipline of humanities, those in which anchor the claims of identity that we can best observe the phenomena of osmosis and the dynamics of cultural transfers. Without the need of translation, the most prominent representatives of the humanities in Russia on literary history to art history and philology to anthropology have always been readers of what Germany produced in the same field. They were also sometimes German or German speaking or partly trained in German universities. In fact, what Russia retained from the impetus borrowed from German science is not always what German memory itself has preserved from the early stages of its own history. There are philosophers, theorists, historians who have lost all importance in their original German context, but found a new one in the Russian context, the function of which may be, from the perspective of the cultural history of Germany, to preserve traces of it. We thus find in the geological strata of the Russian cultural space, the fossil strata of a forgotten Germany. It is particularly necessary to concentrate on the history of knowledge because the forms of identity construction are always located at this level. Literary history and historiography are necessary to constitute a nation. These tools used to build an identity always have a tendency to suppress and conceal imported materials by reinterpreting them from one context to another. The choice of subjects made for this demonstration is partly random. We cannot follow all of the humanities, but maybe some of them are more likely than others to illustrate the transition areas. German philosophy was a central reference in the philosophical history of Russia from the period when the disputes between Westernizers and Slavophiles took place on the background of an appropriation of Hegel and Schelling through attempt to stem the Kantianism through Bergson until the discovery of Husserl's phenomenology by Gustav Spiet. While psychology is a dominant human science in Germany in the last third of the 19th century, Russia has not escaped this influence, but we can also observe a strong presence in the Russian sphere of references to German philology or to history of art that grows better than elsewhere in German speaking countries. The transition from one cultural sphere to another can moreover lead to another transition from one discipline to another. Mediations 
which allow the passage of elements of the scientific culture to another at diverse in nature. Minorities living on one side or another of the border are with travelers the most obvious sociological mediation. And then there are, of course, the universities. In this regard, we must especially take in a look at Dorpat, a German language university town, but under the direct authority of German officers of the court of St. Petersburg. To be more precise, the founder of Dorpat, Paro, was Germanized French from the enclave of Württemberg in France, Montbéliard, Mumpelgard. Dorpat was a Russian university of German language until the 1880s, where it was renamed Yuriev. More generally, we can say that the Baltic territories, home for German subjects of the Russian Empire, represented a bridge between the two cultures and at the same time were a sort of resource pool of administrative officials dedicated to the empire. But there are also areas of German-Russian mediation in Germany. We primarily think of the University of Göttingen. It was a sort of reservoir from which Sergei Uvarov, long in charge of higher education in Russia, was getting new teachers from. Schlötzer also came from Göttingen. Thanks his edition of the Rus Primary Chronicle or Nestor's Chronicle, he was one of the first historians of the Russian Middle Ages and to Göttingen he returned after a long stay in Russia. The first Russian students came to Leipzig in the 18th century, including Radishev, famous author of the journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. One could also consider the University of Marburg, insofar as this whole book of German neo-Kantianism was also a training venue for several generations of Russian philosophers. Later on, as with Alexander von Humboldt, Lomonosov was trained at the Freiburg University of Mining and Technology. The observation of transfer between Germany and Russia helps up to update the geography of the meeting point. The German-Russian sphere seems to shrink to areas of extreme imbrication where the transfers mainly occur. The exploration of German-Russian cultural transfers in the field of the history of the knowledge should incorporate the issue of language. In the Russian sphere, even the Russian scientific language was in competition with German or French until the mid 19th century. It's common to find in the scientific journals, such as the ones of the uh, Annals of the Academy of Science in St. Petersburg, articles in French or German, whose authors are often teachers from Western Europe and who continue to conduct their scientific life in their native language, but in Russia. Let us look now at a passionate historian of the German and Russian national antiquities, Friedrich Fyodor Alexandrovich Braun. Born in 1862 in St. Petersburg, he studied German philology uh, in St. Petersburg from 1880 to 1885 uh, be, uh, um, before becoming a high school teacher and then private docent in 1888 and professor from 1900. He had to leave Russia at the time of First World War and settled in Leipzig. Later, uh, in uh, 1920, the Soviet Commissariat for Education commissioned him to put together a large bibliography of all German scientific work published since 1914. Becoming professor of German language and literature in Leipzig in 1922, he remained at the same time a Russian language assistant in 1926. He was co-director of a Leipzig Institute for Research on Eastern Europe. He is credited in the 1920s with the German translation of Russian historical works like the history of uh, Klushevsky, of whom he had been a pupil. He co-edited with Maxim Gorky a, a journal on the first emigration, which was published from uh, 1922 to 1923 under the name of Biseda. And so he was appointed in 1926 as a corresponding member of the Academy of Sciences, the Russian Academy of Sciences. He did not return to Russia, but this title earned him some trouble during the Nazi era. He died in 1942. Dean of the Petersburg Faculty of Arts and president of the Philologists Circle, this little known figure of German studies at the heart of the Russian humanities after the Veselovsky generation 
deserves particular attention to the extent that he too was a medievalist. His area of personal investigation was a question of relations between the gods and Slavs. He investigated the amazing traces that constituted up to the 17th century the gods of Crimea in the footsteps of their migration, their language, and their absorption by the Tatar ethnic background. More broadly, he was interested in Germanic influences on the legions of ancient Russia, but also in the history of German Romanticism. Brown is certainly one of those responsible for a shift in the Russian scientific curiosity around 1900 to the question of German, German medieval culture. A field of Russian history that deserves to be addressed, especially in terms of cultural transfers, is that of Russian Orientalism. On the one hand, the extension to Central Asia since the capture of Kazan is one of the fundamental elements of Russian history, and it is precisely in Kazan that was shaped since the early 19th century a Russian science of the East. It involved learning Tatar and other Asian languages. Russian Orientalism was then developed in St. Petersburg with a conviction to understand the Eastern cultures integrated into the empire, but also with the idea of developing a new form of humanism in which knowledge of Greek antiquity would marry with knowledge of the East, where one would look for traces of lost Greek works and Persian texts. But what is striking in this long history of Russian Orientalism, which includes a reference to Central Asia in Russian humanities, and will only be reinforced during the time when a part of Russian intellectuals, like Zhermunsky, will be moved to Tashkent in the 1940s, is that it is largely due to the uh, emigration of French or German scholars. Taking, for example, Christian Martin Fren from Rostock, who taught Oriental languages at Kazan before moving to St. Petersburg through to Alexander von uh, Stahl Holstein, who began his career as sinologist in St. Petersburg before he finished it in Beijing. Russian Orientalism is largely a matter of foreign scholars, especially Germans. After an overview of the examples provided by the German Russian history, my main wonder what new perspectives and contributions are related to the methodology of cultural transfers. The first point relates to the detection of a very heterogeneous structure of the memory that does not reflect any archival order, very oriented towards highlighting nationalism. One assumes more or less that any country develops itself on the basis of internal dynamics. Saxony at the core of a culture of a future a German identity appropriates such foreign cultural objects whose link with a foreign country is gradually repressed in German history. We will remember that in the 18th century, Polish and Ukrainian Jewish merchants had made the fortune of the main fair in Germany. In the dynamics of ownership of something foreign, isolated social groups can play a prominent role disproportionate to their demographic weight. For comparativism, which confront this historical phenomena, these groups who fully deserve a historical analysis play no role. Research on cultural transfers is further able to analyze the transformations that the receiving context owes to foreign exportation. For example, the Leipzig Fair has no actual existence independently from the Polish Jews and Greek traders' seasonal immigration. The reception of Russian music in France in the late 19th century profoundly modified the Parisian musical context by offering an alternative to the dominance of German music and of uh, Wagnerism. The German merchant who ran the export of Bordeaux wines in the 18th and 19th century changed the face of the city of the French province, although they were mainly interested in their own business. The difference between the original context and the host which does not have much sense in the historical comparativist context is crucial to address a cultural transfer, showing the implication of two cultural systems. A second contribution of the research on cultural transfer seems to rest on the fact that the distribution of European space is transformed because of them. The link between the regions draws new ideas and detaches, uh, and detaches the regions from the various national frameworks to the point of making a historiography possible 
that is no more ethnocentric. A new form of transnational historiography could be based on the idea of not considering the specific territories as comparable units, but as interweaving parts of a puzzle. Besides the artificially constructed national or territorial identity, there would be, in fact, a seminal foreignness to introduce into a historical consciousness. Precisely in the case of the historical perception of regions with low population, this mode of approach avoids relegation in peripheral positions. Generally, the opposition between a center and a periphery is irrelevant in the research on cultural transfer. This is because many Scandinavians ensured an important mediation between France and Germany that their story deserves as much attention as the European center. Russia is just central, uh, it, just, uh, as central in Europe as France or Germany because one would not conceive for example, the French intellectual history of the last hundred years without a structural link with Russia, from Russian novels to the history of science passing through the aesthetics of the early 20th century. But different aspects may be emphasized. Even though the Greek reference is the construction of Berlin as a German capital during the 19th century was central, we think, for example, of the museums in the, in the heart of Berlin, we will particularly remember the case of Munich among the most striking manifestations of German Hellenism in the 19th century. Munich often referred to as the Athens of the Isar combines a prominent role in the political philhellenism, as well as more than other reg regions, the German presence in Greece, but also helps to show the ambiguity of the Greek reference. We have to remember that it is kind uh, King Ludwig the first, initially a liberal ruler who became increasingly despotic, that triggers the Bavarian Philhellenic movement. And it is in Munich that the Greek decors reach a stage of inauthenticity, which contributed to the emergence of the kitsch concept. The Greek periphery is at the center of Germany, as Christ Pantocrator uh, of Theophanes, the Greek, is at the center of Moscow. It is clear that an applied research of this phenomenon of implication and of re reinterpretation linked to implication is likely to exceed the national history of humanities and open a wide field on investigation, which could be the form to come of the cultural history of Europe. If there is no need to stress here that Russia is part for, uh, of Europe, very precisely of the German of French cultural history, and conversely, Europe is part of Russia, the systematic history of the implications still largely needs to be written. Russia is only one case among others, and it is an ensemble of cultural areas forming the European space that could now be examined in this way. There is certainly no question in denying strong identity. Spain is not Germany, but to show how far they are built. Comparativism may be also taken into account in a, a diachronical uh, study of transnational historiography, including mainly research on cultural transfers. The first attempt to broaden the history of Western Europe uh, to the Eastern territories or peripheries already involved integrating annals or written records of the outer regions within a framework that hitherto did not consider their own perspective. They were thereby reinterpreted. Cultural transfers take over all the comparisons in overview representations by a research of procedures of re-semantization of historical objects and by the vectors of these re-semantizations. The question of German-Russian or French-German-Russian cultural transfers during the rule of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century is a particularly rich field to approach for this method of research it particularly allows the overcoming of the problems of center and periphery that comparativism in the narrowest sense had difficulty solving. It reassesses the tradition of national literature, national history. It is true that the very term comparativism covers various types of historiography, and as soon as it incorporates a history of relations in German Beziehungsgeschichte, it highlights a phenomena of semantic displacement, confronts itself to share the entangled history and converges strongly with research and cultural transfers on creation of new sense through efficient interweaving 
of uh, various cultures. Thank you for your attention. Michel, thank you very much for your lecture. And now question, please. So uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, Michel, a question in, in chat. For your presentation, I have a question. We want to put up the whole garden to put up and stuff. I will not try to transform the reality of the late 19th, first half of the 20th to be the value of the human Well, I uh, agree uh, completely with uh, the assessment and the question of Anastasia Stravinsky. Uh, of course, it's a, a very interesting topic to see how uh, personalities uh, are, uh, migrate from one country to the other, but uh, remain uh, uh, representatives of uh, their own uh, cultural roots, uh, which are uh, to a large extent, uh, not only transported, but even uh, transformed, uh, reinterpreted, and uh, after uh, one generation belong to the heritage of the uh, guest country. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, exactly what uh, we have to understand at a, a cultural transfer, this uh, circulation of person, uh, ideas, and, and uh, uh, aesthetic uh, orientations which are transformed uh, during uh, the, the travel uh, through uh, the European space. Mm -hmm. uh, please, more questions. Valerie, may mm -hmm. I? Sure. Thank you, Valerie. Um, Monsieur Espagne, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, profound outline of your concept, uh, transfer culturel, generally and particularly, you know, pertaining to individual bilateral and trilateral uh, cases. And my question vient de votre déclaration que any movement of a cultural object from one context into another results in transformation of its meaning. Does it mean that, let's say, Paul Cézanne's masterpieces would be understood and interpreted differently, let's say, in Aix-en-Provence and in Nizhny Novgorod? Thank you. Thank you very much, of course. Uh, I think if you take any object, uh, for instance, a painting, and uh, you uh, are showing the painting uh, outside of uh, the, the museum where it is conserved. And uh, this uh, painting has uh, another, another meaning for uh, the people uh, looking at it uh, in uh, the, a foreign country. Uh, a good example is uh, the, the fact that uh, Napoleon uh, has uh, he, uh, uh, make uh, war in European uh, countries, uh, took all sorts of, of painting in private German collections. And uh, these paintings were uh, public uh, publicly showed for the first time uh, in Paris. And um, they, they played no role at all in, in German cultural history uh, before uh, they had been um, showed in a, a, a Paris museum before uh, returning uh, to, to Germany uh, after the Napoleon era. Uh, the, the fact that, the, uh, the, that this painting had been um, stolen and uh, had been shown in a foreign country uh, and that uh, um, uh, writers uh, like uh, the brothers Schlegel wrote 
about uh, these uh, stolen paintings it changes completely uh, the, the meaning of these objects of art. Uh, but I think uh, you can refer to, uh, to, to object of all day's life. If you, if you take a bottle of Bordeaux wine, the bottle of Bordeaux wine, uh, which was exported in the 18th century to St. Petersburg, um, along the, the, the Baltic uh, countries, uh, had not the same uh, way of, uh, of, of uh, and, and, the, and the same valor and, and, the, and the same meaning uh, in the Russian context than in, in the in, in Bordeaux context. Uh, the the um, possibility to, to drink this wine in salon or in, in a special society uh, gave uh, this uh, very simple bottle of wine uh, a, a completely different uh, meaning, a, a completely different uh, value. Oh, thank you. It's a uh, très intéressant. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much. More questions, please. So uh, I'm very impressed by two lectures we've listened to. My question uh, to Michelle Espagne, mm, what do you think about the polariz polarization in uh, culture, political and cultural polarization, uh, how it stands to, to, to the process of cultural trans transfer? Uh, I, I think polarization is a, a very uh, impressive concept. We, we should have a long discussion uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, the, 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 the Professor Alex, Alexerov to uh, understand exactly uh, what uh, uh, it, it means in the field of cultural transfer. Uh, I, what is uh, very important for, for my uh, point of view in the question of cultural transfer is a sort of concentration of space. Um, and it's a form of polarization, if you want. Uh, we have to focus uh, on, on uh, particular uh, places uh, where the cultural transfer uh, takes place. It, it, it doesn't take place equally uh, in all the Russian space or in all the German space, but uh, you have to stress uh, the position of, um, of uh, towns like uh, Göttingen or, or Leipzig, or in Russia, of course, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and, and Warsaw, uh, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, uh, for, uh, for, for economic uh, reasons. Uh, 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 it's my, my way to understand the, the concepts of polarization. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, Can you ask me Sure. Конечно. Я прошу прощения, у меня сейчас не работает видео, поэтому я не могу включить видеокамеру, но я потом ее налажу. Вопрос Мишелю, Испанию. А как он видит, как, как ты видишь дальнейшее развитие теории методологии культурного трансфера? Это одна сторона вопроса. И как ты видишь прошлое культурного трансфера? Были ли резкие изменения слова, потому что все-таки эта теория уже просуществовала сколько? Более трех десяти, даже больше, почти четыре десятилетия, да? Mm -hmm. То есть, э, насколько можно говорить об эволюции? Я думаю, Et d'autre part, euh, comment tu vois l'histoire, l'évolution de cette technologie, de cette théorie Est-ce que tu penses qu'il y avait des ruptures là-dedans au cours de ces, euh, j'ai mal calculé, peut-être trois ou quatre décennies euh, de, de l'existence de cette théorie Merci. Euh, 
uh, I think uh, Yekaterina Dmitrieva knows as well uh, as me uh, the, the tendencies of research on cultural transfers and the uh, evolution uh, in the next uh, period. Um, uh, we, we began, uh, I'm Germanist, uh, my special uh, uh, field of inquiry is uh, uh, German cultural history. And uh, of course, uh, I began with uh, the relation between uh, French and Germany. Uh, and we try at the second step, and we see Kateria Dmitrieva especially, to extend uh, this point of view uh, to, uh, the, to the, the Russian uh, uh, space. But um, after uh, two decades, uh, we observed that it was quite possible uh, to uh, consider uh, the model of cultural transfer between uh, remote, for us uh, European citizens, remote uh, places uh, in, in the world, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Vietnam and France or, or, Ch or China and, and, and Europe. Uh, but um, of course, uh, if we take into account uh, with uh, remote places, uh, we have uh, to uh, change the, the concepts uh, we are using because uh, every uh, case study uh, may be considered as a, a possible enlargement of the uh, theoretical background. Um, uh, the, the, we have uh, no definition, uh, one for all times, uh, of uh, the, the cultural uh, transfer. Cultural transfer may um, have an, an evolution and may be transformed uh, so long uh, we uh, face uh, different uh, case studies, uh, including uh, especially uh, other parts of the world. And uh, now uh, I, I'm with some colleagues uh, from, from ch China uh, trying uh, to uh, see how uh, this concept may be used uh, in the, in, in the, the Chinese-speaking world. Uh, it's well known, for instance, that Buddhism uh, uh, has, uh, at the beginning, uh, no roots in China itself, but, but was imported and uh, completely changed uh, from uh, India. And uh, we know that uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, um, Russian literature and uh, West European literature was uh, translated in, into China and, and it was a new basis for the evolution of Chinese literature and, and culture uh, and, and so on. Uh, I think uh, the, the concept of cultural transfer uh, may be used and may be uh, applied to a different uh, culture in the world, but uh, we have to, to take into account that uh, uh, it is not um, a, a concept uh, that has been defined uh, for, uh, uh, for, every, uh, for all the times, but that it has been to be uh, changed and uh, uh, it is uh, involved in uh, an uh, historical evolution. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ekaterina Dmitrieva. Thank you very much, Michelle Espagne. Uh, I see no questions. Uh, may I ask a small question, please? Yeah. Do we have time? Uh, one question, sure. Please. Thank you. So thank you for the very nice presentation, Professor Espan. And uh, my question, maybe it's quite trivial, but it's regarding the role of person in cultural role transfer, especially in the early times of uh, Russia, if you say about 18th century. Uh, what is your opinion? Is uh, the role, say, of Peter the Great or Ekaterina the Great uh, is the key uh, in cult cultural transfer of European culture to Russia? Or uh, we can say that it's not the, key, the their, role, their role is not that significant and anyway, the uh, cultural transfer would happen. Uh, I think we have, of course, to, to focus uh, on uh, the influence of uh, uh, Catherine de Greet uh, and of the Academy of Sciences uh, in St. Petersburg in the definition of, of 
cultural transfer in the first times of Russia. It's, for instance, very interesting to uh, look at the, the definition of the Russian uh, nationality that gave um, um, uh, Siegfried Bayer. Siegfried Bayer was one of these uh, uh, Germans and uh, he tried uh, to, to give a uh, uh, definition of, of Russia and it introduced uh, the idea uh, that the, the, first, um, uh, the first kings uh, in Russia uh, were uh, people coming from Scandinavia. Uh, and um, so you, you have to, um, to, to face uh, this strange uh, configuration. Uh, one German uh, settled in St. Petersburg, tried to uh, define the host country, and uh, he, he thinks uh, the, the, the roots for the civilization in, uh, in Russia uh, are uh, to, to seek uh, in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, but uh, this uh, Bayer uh, observed that um, in the, the first times of, of Russia, uh, the, the Mongolian uh, uh, ethnic groups uh, played a great role and uh, that to a great extent uh, uh, a cultural transfer uh, between a Mongolian uh, people and uh, the first uh, uh, Russian ethnic groups took place in the Middle Ages. Uh, at the origin of the uh, attempts to define a Russian culture, you, you have uh, these, uh, all these sorts of cultural transfers from Scandinavia, from Germany, and from uh, Mong uh, Central Asia and uh, Mongol ethnic groups. Very great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Michel Espagne. And, uh, I'm very pleased now to give the floor to professor of the High School of Economics in Nizhny Novgorod, Edward Babkin, who will present the next plenary speaker. Please. Спасибо, Валерий Григорьевич. Thank you, Professor Жусман. Я рад приветствовать коллег на такой важной междисциплинарной конференции, которая обсуждает вопросы культурного трансфера и влияния его на развитие человеческого капитала. Hello, everybody. I'm welcome, uh, everybody, to this important conference, which discusses uh, the issues of cultural transfer and its influence uh, on uh, the improvement of uh, human capital. Uh, большим uh, воодушевлением, большой радостью я сегодня хочу представить нашего следующего докладчика, uh, доктора Яна Станека. Uh, доктор Ян Станек работает в Университете Южной Австралии. Он занимает позицию руководителя образовательной программы по медицинской информатике, а также является uh, участником Центра по индустриальному uh, искусственному интеллекту. Uh, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce Dr. Ян Станек. Dr. Ян Станек uh, is working for University of South Australia. Uh, he takes the position of uh, program director in health informatics. Also, he takes a position of researcher in the center of uh, industrial uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, Доктор Ян Станек имеет очень интересную профессиональную судьбу. В этом году он отмечает 40-летний юбилей с момента выпуска из медицинского uh, университета. За эти 40 лет uh, доктор Ян Станек имел возможность получить богатый опыт в одной из самых сложных медицинских профессий в области интенсивной медицины. Доктор Ян Станек участвовал в самых первых проектах по использованию вычислительных технологий компьютерного интеллекта при разработке рекомендательных систем. Сегодня он продолжает свою активную образовательную и исследовательскую работу в Австралии активно занимается вопросами внедрения цифровой медицины и того самого культурного трансфера между разными заинтересованными сторонами. Доктор Ян Станек celebrates this year 40 years of his graduation from the medical university during this time. He spent uh, a lot of efforts to gain knowledge in intensive therapy. He was uh, a pioneer of application of artificial intelligence for medical decision support systems. 
And now he uh, is active uh, member of uh, digital health community in South Australia, continue research and uh, education in the domain of uh, application of uh, artificial intelligence for medical decision support systems. Uh, я думаю, что uh, рассказ о современном состоянии дел в области искусственного интеллекта для медицины подчеркнет важность культурного трансфера, как минимум между двумя человеческими сторонами, между медиками и специалистами в области компьютерных технологий искусственного интеллекта, и еще одной искусственной стороной, вот те самыми алгоритмами искусственного интеллекта, на которые сегодня возлагается такая большая надежда. I think that talk of uh, Dr. Jan Stanek about uh, clinical decision support systems will emphasize importance of cultural transfer between at least two traditional human parts, between uh, healthcare specialists and specialists in IT systems. And also uh, the cultural transfer is important when we take into account artificial stakeholders. Those uh, algorithms of uh, artificial intelligence, which are very important now for promotion of new digital uh, health system. So, uh, welcome, Jan Stanek, to this conference. Let's start the speech. I would like to emphasize that uh, practitioners of the conference can ask questions both in Russian and in English because uh, Dr. Jan Stanek is fluent in uh, Russian. Dear Eduard, um, thank you very much for your uh, extensive introduction. And uh, uh, thank you very much to my esteemed colleagues uh, to have me in your conference. So allow me to share my screen with you. Okay. There we go. Uh, so uh, today I will be uh, talking about explainable uh, AI. Yeah, so because um, explanation is uh, a way of communication uh, between uh, the uh, actually stakeholders. So first of all, I would like to talk about what is the A in AI. Because as Edward said, I'm an AI veteran in a way. So when the whole story started, the A was strongly perceived as artificial. Yeah? So and. Many of the projects were talking about replacing the human, uh, replacing the physician as a diagnostician in a system. And indeed, uh, we implemented a system running at the back uh, of uh, the hospital information system, uh, which was performing uh, evaluation of neurologic symptoms and signs and um, making a diagnostics of uh, head and nerves. Yes, that was an interesting implementation in uh, neurology. <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, uh, now uh, what we see are other meanings of the A. Yeah, so first of all, we see a lot of systems which where A stands for autonomous. Yeah? So when it means that um, that's continuing the um, paradigm of artificial, yeah? so it's really uh, the machine will replace the human, yeah? so its self-driving cars will replace the driver. And uh, while cars driving in traffic are still a little bit futuristic, we already see self-driving trucks in, uh, for example, in Western Australia, we have got self-driving driving trains. Yeah? So if you happen to go to the Pilbara region, don't wear anything red because that's a sign for the AI driving the train to stop. Yeah, so until you will get in trouble. So uh, autonomous systems uh, uh, from the point of view of explanation uh, may not need uh, extensive explanation because obviously they're replacing humans, uh, but uh, that's only part of the story because uh, when uh, we want to analyze what happened, yes, and we have seen, for example, a Tesla, a Tesla car crash, then we really want to understand what happened. And then as part of this section of the, uh, of the decisions which were made at the time, we may need uh, some analytic uh, mechanism or explanation mechanism, uh, which would do the decision-making post-mortem. Uh, 
And um, last but not least, and that's much more in the theme of this conference, is the augmented. Yeah, so these days we see uh, AI to work in collaboration with people, essentially not replacing them, no, not being artificial to that sense, but actually augmenting the people's abilities and uh, uh, making sure that humans are actually more efficient, that there are less errors to be made, that uh, some of the boring tasks are taken away, and essentially to, as we hope, to make the human lives a bit more livable. Okay, so uh, we uh, mostly when I will, when I will be talking about explanation, I will be talking about uh, the augmented paradigm, where the AI is working along along with humans. But um, before we actually start talking about explanations, yeah, so uh, we may need to look at uh, when we actually need explanation, and that's uh, something which. Uh, probably people with cognitive psychology would be able to answer you know, to a better level. But um, looking at some factors which influence uh, the need for explanation is, uh, for example, the high or low stakes. Um, as an example, if we ask Google Maps to navigate us from point A to point B, yeah, so we get instructions, something like um, turn right to the next intersection, yeah, so nice and fine, we do it. We're not going to ask, why do you think so? Yeah, so the worst case, what can happen? We end up in some cul-de-sac and turn around and the uh, AI will recalculate another route for us. On the other hand, um, if um, we have high stakes situation as we have frequently in medicine, uh, imagine that based on uh, history, uh, lab results and genetic testing, now we recommend a bilateral mastectomy for a young woman. Yeah, so imagine the horror of that. Yeah, so the, for sure, all the people who are involved in that will be asking uh, why, what happened? Is this really necessary? What are the odds? What are the risks? Uh, you know, and, and that means that how we actually make sure that, uh, that uh, the triangle between the AI recommender, uh, the physician, and the patients and their family is somehow closed and uh, that the communication is meaningful. Yeah, so, and it's, that's an example of high stakes and non-reversible operation. Yeah, so because the operation is not reversible. So reversibility of the result can be another, another question when we need an explanation because uh, there is no, uh, no return from if we just act on that recommendation. Uh, another factor is complexity of the task. Yeah? So in simple tasks, even if they may require some explanation, typically the explanation is trivial and uh, for people who know their business can be more annoying than helpful. Yeah? So, but in a complex task, uh, it's really a question uh, that um, we may ask, why the hell, hey, how, how did you come to this, to this conclusion? Where does this come from? Yeah, so, and then the explanation is needed. Another factor is expectations. Yeah, so uh, frequent things happen frequently. Yeah? So if we expect something, then the recommender just confirms our expectation. We go along with, it, with our life and kind of don't ask too many questions. Yeah? So we kind of are happy. In a moment, we get a surprising recommendation. Yeah? So that's just like, why? Yeah, so what happened? Why there is this dissonance? Yeah, so, so it's, comes across our expectations. Yeah? So that means uh, expectations play a role in need to explain. The question is how the system is supposed to know what the expectations are, yeah? so when to, in offering explanation or not. Yes, and also level of human involvement is, uh, is a factor because the more humans are involved, yeah? so the more, if we get into the collaboration kind of mode, yeah, so then explanation is much more important than if uh, the system works in an autonomous mode. Yeah, so uh, even with the, in the autonomous mode, uh, I, would, uh, I have seen a nice video of a Yandex car driving around in Los, An in Los Angeles. Yes, and while the car was driving on itself, yeah, so, so there was still a decent user interface uh, which uh, informed the operator sitting on the back seat 
on uh, how the car was actually making the decisions, what are the plans, uh, what are the projected routes, and so on and so on. And so that gave the operator some insight and allowed, uh, allowed them to a, intervene if something would appear to go wrong, uh, because it's still a prototype. And B, it, it um, helped actually to test the systems. And so even autonomous, that means even autonomous systems uh, may require uh, solid levels of, uh, of uh, explanation at certain stage. Obviously there is space for research, yeah? so because uh, what I'm saying is more informal than a result of uh, exhaustive formal research. Uh, now, from the, from the point of the user, yeah, so uh, when we look at uh, why explanation is needed, yeah, so uh, we may need it for scientific understanding. Yeah? So if, if the system, if we do exploration, the machine learning is frequently used for that. Yeah? So we get some uh, analytic signals, we get some statements, we get some rules out of uh, big data. Yeah? So now the question is uh, to make some sense out of it. How does it fit into existing knowledge? And um, in many ways, how the kind of knowledge uh, which was newly created is transferred meaningfully from the AI system into the learned community, yeah, so the human community. Another, uh, another reason or another domain where we need explanations and uh, maybe different kind of explanation is verification of the system. And yeah? so we can't collaborate with a system if we don't trust it. Yeah, so because uh, if you don't trust a self-driving car, you, you would be always on edge if the car would, would be in an autonomous mode. And it makes no sense. Yeah, so uh, you would not be able to get, uh, get uh, peacefully in an aircraft because aircrafts fly in an autonomous way uh, the majority of the route. Yeah, so and so on and so on. Yeah, so, so our environment is becoming more and more infested to put that way with um, uh, more or less autonomous systems. Yeah, so, so and it means that uh, uh, we gain some trust by making those systems more transparent so that we kind of start to understand how those systems make the decisions, how they operate, and that incites some trust. Another question is improvement on a system. Yeah? So, so no system is perfect. Yeah? So how we can improve it, uh, how, how we can actually get some insight on what's happening in there. And um, uh, safety and compliance is a specific domain because, for example, in healthcare, uh, it's uh, increasingly mandatory in most countries uh, to get um, AI systems uh, to get approved and tested in a similar way as, as you get tested drugs. Yeah? So that means that FDA will, in the US will approve AI systems. Uh, drug and uh, TGA in Australia, it's a similar authority, will approve uh, AI systems on, uh, in actually Australia. So, so it means that there needs to be some insight uh, and uh, there needs to be some understanding of what's going on in the system. You know? So, so uh, make it more explicit, make it more human understandable uh, so that we can trust the systems and that we can actually confirm that the system is, is uh, safe and compliant. When working with humans, yes, so it's a question that uh, in many cases, there is not the one silver bullet solution. And so that you have actually multitude of solutions and you want to know, okay, there are three possible treatments uh, for a specific patient, which one is the best? Yeah? So what are the pros and cons? And uh, why exactly this was deemed to be the superior? Is it by a big difference or, uh, or is it just tiny difference between the two? So they're almost equal. Yeah? So, or, or why one was, was considered to be superior to the other? Yeah? So the understanding those trade-offs is actually very, um, very important. Now we got systems which can do causal reasoning. Yeah? So that, that causality understanding as part of explanation can be an issue. So that we ask why this happened. Yes, okay, because A is causing B and because we have this model and, and that's how it works. And uh, that means that if we have the systems who generate the knowledge, so because we talk about big data, now we do big analytics on them, we create big knowledge. Yeah, so now how that knowledge fits into our existing knowledge, it's uh, an extremely tricky question. 
Yeah, so because there is no easy formal method of doing that. Yeah, so if you think about it. Yeah, so so and that means that uh, that um, uh, how you do the transfer of knowledge uh, from the research, which is somewhere done at the front end by all kinds of nice AI systems, how it's transferred so that the learned community can actually digest it, can to put it in the context of existing knowledge, uh, can sort out any discrepancies and so on and so on. So, so that means that uh, uh, part of transfer of knowledge is actually understanding of, of how the knowledge was created, how the systems actually did it. And that means that AI needs to be transparent and we need a certain type of explanations. Uh, when we deploy uh, AI in, for example, uh, human resources, yeah, so there are known, uh, known problems with ethics and fairness. Yeah, so because machine learning learns some patterns and uh, they can learn wrong patterns. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, there were quite a lot of uh, examples of um, certain candidates were systematically rejected by the systems just because they were wearing a big dark beard for example. Yeah, so, so seeing into those factors, yeah, so and trying to get inside to explain why you reject this candidate and why you prefer that candidate uh, would actually help to, to um, mitigate uh, those possible those possible errors. Yeah, so and I mentioned safety, yeah, so uh, in verification of the systems. Yeah, so it's not just the compliance, it's also when you use a, something, you uh, need to know that the system may be approaching its edges. Yes. Yeah? So in humans, we, uh, when we reason and when we explain something, it's a kind of graceful degradation. Yeah. So first I know it. Yes. Yeah? So then I work from first principle. Then I have some intuition. Then I use common sense. Yes. Yeah? So it's degrading uh, gradually. Yes. Yeah? So many AI systems, uh, when you get beyond their uh, area of expertise, they fall off the cliff. Yeah, so the question is uh, uh, to know when it's going to happen so that uh, the system is not actually pushed over the ball. Now, how the explanation can be done? Yeah, so uh, uh, when uh, we started doing our, our business and we built some knowledge-based systems, so typical explanation would show the reasoning trace and underlying knowledge. Yeah, so uh, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, but uh, that even if you visualize that, even if you have this logical constructs, that's still not exactly uh, the knowledge which is uh, a good explanation to all humans. Yeah? So uh, as in a reverse gambit, uh, it is possible to show that if you look in medical textbooks, we see a lot of uh, constructs there which look like production rules. Yet we learned in the first wave of uh, knowledge engineering in so the 80s that uh, it is simply not possible to take those rules and implement them in a machine because they meant for humans. And so that means that there is the same construct which looks like a production rule. If it's in a machine, it might not be readily understood by people. If it's in a textbook, it might not be readily implementable in a machine. And so the question how to do this transfer between the um, I would say silico and uh, uh, carbon biological entities uh, can be a serious question. Uh, then there is a whole, a whole uh, family of Bayesian systems of probabilistic systems. Yeah? So where the explanation is based on probabilities. Uh, by experience, we know when there are studies uh, uh, taking into account learned people. Yeah? So like people, uh, medicals working in gynecology and obstetrics uh, that people are systematically wrong and systematically awkward to work with probabilities. Yes, and in many ways, uh, uh, that's true. Yeah? So uh, people fear flying, but it's actually much more risky to drive a car in a crowded city. Yeah? So, so, but if you fly, they don't fear to hop in a taxi with a stranger. Yeah, so uh, the question with probability, probabilities is that uh, in medical decision-making, is that um, if uh, the system, the recommender tells me, oh, you got a 75% probability of left ventricle uh, hypertension. Hyper, uh, yeah? So then I still need to choose, I need to make a decision. Yeah? So do I need to do medication or not? Yeah? So my actions are categorical, 
while the recommending probability, recommended probability is actually continuous. Yeah, so in this mapping, it's it's uh, needs to be sorted out as well and explained and implemented. There are a, there is a family of systems which based on models. Yeah, so again, um, uh, one of the important applications of it is uh, drug dosage uh, recommenders. Yeah, so there are toxic drugs where you build a one or two compartment model and uh, you feed some of the physiologic data uh, in uh, some constants in the model. And it will tell you that for uh, John Doe, you have to give that amount of the drug in such and such time intervals. Yeah? So if the person has renal function, such and such. Yeah? So explaining that is another story. Yeah? So because there are a lot of uh, uh, arbitrary values involved. Yeah? So like uh, some of the you know, physiology data of the drug is an arbitrary constant, which may not fully apply for the particular patient. And yeah? so, so that means they're working out and tuning and explaining these models and communicating why the dose is as it is, uh, is an issue. Yeah? So, so because these models can make errors. Yeah? So the errors can be actually detrimental for a specific patient. Yeah, so then we can we can have a systems systems which uh, operate on similarity as yeah, so case based systems. Uh, again, uh, in many cases, the explanation ends up uh, reasoning on on frequency. Yeah, so and uh, last but not least, uh, back to machine learning. Yeah, so uh, where machine learning it's um, uh, using all kinds of trained uh, constants uh, in this kind of layers which are not human understandable. Yeah? So they mathematical entities, uh, they do not easily map to any human understandable concepts. And that's, that makes it um, a challenge to, to explain that. Yeah? So, and there are several possibilities uh, of, of uh, how that can be approached. Yeah? So uh, in DARPA, yeah? so there, are, there is a concept of, let's have a look here. Yeah? So that's the classical system where you get training data, you run it through the machine learning process, you get this learn function, yeah, so which is an abstraction, which is not, not uh, human understandable in this sense, but then it does some decision on or recommendation. And then a user is just worrying that, uh, and I've got a lot of questions uh, on um, how to make some sense out of the recommendation. Yeah, so essentially the knowledge which was created here is not, actually transferred here. Yeah? So it's just saying, okay, do this. Yeah? So then, uh, why did you do that? Or why am I supposed to do that? So why not something else? Yeah? So how do I know? Yeah? So it's a successful scenario yeah? so, and so on and so on. So uh, they actually hypothesized that they should put some explanation, explainable model. Uh, so the machine learning would infer an explainable model and uh, then the explanation interface will actually help to answer this question. And uh, indeed, uh, it looks good on a slide, yes. Yeah? So, but uh, this is an area of uh, very aggressive and active research all over the world, because um, while there are a lot of theories and a lot of prototypes and ideas, uh, this task is not yet successfully resolved. There is another another approach uh, which um, can be can be used. Yeah? So it's uh, building a meta system. Yeah? So that's your normal, I would say, uh, trail of learning. Yeah? So it gives some results, and then we can have above that a meta system which can be machine learning based or can be something else based, uh, which will observe the reality and uh, try to kind of make some sense out of it. And so it, it is in some ways, it is what we, what we do when, when uh, as a human decision maker, I do a diagnosis. Yeah, so it's not uh, a chance that we talk about clinical picture. Yeah, so because in many cases, the symptoms and signs form a kind of picture and we use a process mentally, which is close to image processing. Yeah, so image recognition or pattern recognition. And that means I establish the diagnosis yeah, so and uh, if, if I asked my uh, older esteemed colleagues when I was a young physician, so why do you think so? I've seen a patient similar to this one 15 years ago when it was something, yeah? so a diagnosis, do cortisol. Yeah? So, so uh, it was reasoning on pattern recognition. Yeah? So, but then if uh, someone would challenge me, 
Yeah, so I'll switch the mode and I would actually try to transfer and base my explanation on my knowledge and go to physiology and anatomy and guidelines and publications and, and have all this world of scientific information uh, ready to explain actually whatever my, my decision, uh, decision was. That's an interesting dichotomy, which can be to a certain extent uh, replicated by artificial systems. The tricky thing is that, that this concept is actually recursive. Yeah? So that uh, if I have explainer who offers explanation, then I can have an explainer of an explainer uh, and so on and so on. Yeah? So, so it can lead to, I'd say, interesting situations. And so when we look at uh, some metrics, yeah? so because we want to understand the explanation as well. Yeah? So there's, this comes from a publication by Hoffman et al. Yeah? So it was published in 2018, Metrics of for Explainable AI. So you got a concept uh, that you have the explainable AI process. Yeah? So that's this yellow one. It's actually similar to what I have shown on the system and meta system. And then there are some metrics. Yeah? So where is uh, the initial instruction will somehow be understood by the human operator. And so how that's understood is a question, yeah? so obviously, yeah? so it can be correct uh, mental model or incorrect mental model depends, yeah? so on, uh, on the interaction. And then there is some explanation offered, yeah? so which uh, needs to follow some goodness criteria, which, which are, for example, like are the, is, the, is the explanation actionable? Yeah? So, uh, does explanation support better understanding? Yeah, so how the results were obtained, how the system works. Yeah, so uh, helps to understand level of reliability and so on. And so, and then obviously test of satisfaction. Yeah, so it's a uh, user satisfaction study. Yeah, so, uh, and it means that this explanation communicates some of the internal working of the, of the system. And the initial mental model is actually updated. Let's hope that in a correct direction. Yeah? So, and again, uh, this interaction, while it again looks nicely on slides, uh, it's a question of uh, solid interdisciplinary collaboration uh, between the cognitive psychology and uh, AI and uh, formal, formal methods and all kinds of other interesting domains. Yeah, so, and uh, at the end of the day, it's supposed to lead to better performance. And again, the performance can be twofold. This is a better performance of the AI system. Yeah, so, so which is improvement of the tool, but uh, the ultimate goal is improvement of the mission. Yeah? So that means uh, if I have recommend the system, do I do a better medicine? Yeah, so are the patient outcomes actually better with the recommender system? Yeah, so, and that's a, that's a tricky tool. Yeah? So, because uh, if you, uh, it, it does not depend just on the AI tool. It depends also on the collaborating humans. And so, and that means that um, when we talk about AI human teams, uh, that means that uh, uh, AI needs to adjust its explanation to the level of understanding of the human. And so that means uh, that means how how to do it. And so it's some tailoring there. Yeah? So so. Uh, we need to know the users, uh, but the AI needs to be flexible because the users learn and, uh, and um, what was important and useful explanation for a novice will be terribly obnoxious for a more experienced user. And so that means it's, uh, it's also a question of culture. Yeah? So different cultures would react to different types of explanation differently. Yeah, so that means things are not easily portable from one end to the other. Yeah? So uh, working across two in, uh, very different domains. Yeah? So one is engineering. Yeah? So another is healthcare. Yeah? So you can imagine that engineers are much more open to, let's say, blunt criticism than my esteemed medical colleagues. Yeah? So, so when it, it's reflected in, in how you can shape and formulate and uh, present any explanations uh, the system has to offer. And on the other hand, yes, yeah, so uh, there are some technical limits uh, of the AI. Yeah? So that means that humans need to be trained to use AI and understand the explanations. And so that requires some understanding the danger is that the more human-like the AI becomes, and uh, now we have got all kinds of um, embodied conversational agents who actually have a body, who have a face, 
which looks more and more humane. And so it's very easy to fall into the error that, oh, we kind of almost talk to a human. And so, so when it means that, uh, that um, there are some inherent technical shortcomings, which uh, users should actually understand uh, when dealing with, uh, with um, intelligent systems. And uh, that means research into the components of collaboration, like look at end user mental models, how we know them, how we can uh, elicit them, because typically they are tacit, so that uh, the um, uh, explanation or the communication from the AI is tailored to the end user mental model. And yeah, so what are the end user cognitive processes so that again, the AI can fit in somehow yeah, so, and optimize the, the fitting into that. Uh, user interfaces, yes. Yeah, so if you look at, at any health informatics system, the user interface is just atrocious. And uh, multiple studies say that um, it is actually uh, a problem. Yeah? So the user interfaces, uh, uh, crowded user interfaces uh, leads to errors. And, and also uh, how to actually configure and shape and build the explainer component so that uh, it works well with, with uh, actually these uh, human components. Okay, so, so um, we did this, we did a explainer uh, to, towards humans to tailor information for diabetic patients. And so because obviously if you diagnose with diabetes, diabetes um, you need to know the essentials, the backbone. Yeah, so what is insulin, how, how I use it, uh, what's the glucose, how it's, what kind of meals uh, do I need to avoid? But if you're diabetic for 20 years, you, you know all the essentials. Yeah? So that means that your, uh, your questions are much more refined. Yeah? So uh, can I have a glass of Bordeaux with a good, good supper once upon a time? Yeah? So that would be the question. And so that means that, that um, uh, one, of, one, one of our PhD students built a recommender who would diagnose the patient's knowledge and so then tailor the actually explanation information to the patient's knowledge so it was another layer of, of loop there so uh, i think that that as edward said yeah so it's um knowledge transfer it's a transfer across uh, a technological boundary which uh, is very challenging but also we need to understand uh, when we eagerly copy or eagerly transfer, for example, in Australia, we transfer a lot of systems from UK or US, which are much bigger markets and make the development of those systems much more viable than for a 24 million uh, people in Australia. It's uh, also a challenge, always a challenge to do Australization of these tools, even though they are inherently written in English. Yeah, so, and it is a massive pain, as, as you can imagine. And it's, between relatively straightforward Anglo-Saxon cultures. Yeah? So I can imagine that it can be a much bigger challenge to transfer the same system to China or to Russia or wherever across these culture, cultural boundaries. So once more, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan, yeah, for such an interesting and challenging talk. Uh, now we have some time for questions. Dear colleagues, please ask questions. Yes, Professor Kolegin, Alexandr, please. Yes, um, thank you very much for a nice lecture. I have a general question. Can we expect a revolution in explanation, especially in machine learning in the nearest future, like it was revolutions in image processing, natural language processing, something like this? Uh, well, I'm rather skeptical. skeptical. Uh, it's 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 possibly it's a legacy that that I'm a veteran from the first enthusiastic bout of of the uh, AI in 70s and 80s, and um, with some experience, we were talking about yatra mathematical enthusiasts. Yeah, so technically, every fifth expert system was medical, and 99% uh, of them were useless. Yes, <laughs> brilliant pieces of pieces of technology. Yeah? So, and uh, many of them had, had actually interesting fate. Yeah? So you may remember a tool called uh, developed in uh, 
I think Stanford, yeah, so it's called Internist 1, Internist 2, then it was Caduceus, it ended up as a quick, uh, quick medical reference. Yeah, so we had the same, same actually ex uh, experience with our system. We created a fancy psychiatric expert system. Yeah? So implemented a DSM-3 at a time. Yeah? So, and then we realized it's seldom used. So we asked the psychiatrist, why, why you don't use it? Oh, we do the right diagnosis ourselves. We, we use the system explanation module if we argue about the case. Yeah, so, so there are already some components of this from the old era. So, but machine learning, it can get discover um, fake relationships. Yeah? So you just get uh, uh, the question is the question is um, how to fit those new bits and pieces into the existing knowledge. Mm -hmm. which is a much bigger challenge than it appears to be. And that's, that's why I'm a bit skeptical. Yeah? So because uh, I think we still struggle in machine learning and my esteemed colleagues will forgive me. Um, while the algorithms are brilliant and perform nicely, um, we do not, did not master yet the whole ecosystem. Yeah? So, so how do we do data preparation for it? Yeah? So, and for machine learning, the data prep and selection of the testing cases and all this is actually essential. Yeah, so because uh, and and that that means that we and that means that uh, that uh, I'm rather skeptical that we will have systems so good that uh, they will be able to offer nice and viable um, explanations in a close foreseeable future. It will eventually come for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, but but it will take it will take some time. I, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, please? Yes, Mikhail, please. Uh, so, Professor Stanek, thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, my question is, can you somehow evaluate the role of the requirement for explanation in diagnostic accuracy of the system? Uh, let us consider that we have uh, the same uh, one problem, so the same uh, training set and the same test set. And we uh, train two systems. One is with requirement for explanation and another without it. Uh, so in, in where the diagnostic accuracy will be higher and what is the reason for that? It's a tricky question, I would say. Um, my answer might be not what you expect. Yeah? So, so uh, the diagnostic accuracy uh, may go uh, the explanation can affect the diagnostic accuracy upwards, not at all, or downwards. And so if you have, if you have a system which, which is uh, seriously obnoxious about, uh, with explanations, then it will actually lower the performance of the end user. And so that, that's why it's an interdisciplinary thing. It's not a technical problem. It's something where, where we need a serious research uh, conducted by techies yeah, so who supply the technology and, and supply this whatever algorithms there might be, uh, end users and people, uh, let's say cognitive psychologists who would make some sense out of what actually works and what doesn't. Just adding explanation mechanism, uh, same as with humans, yeah, so may work or, or may not work. Yeah, so if the explanation is not tailored to your existing knowledge, then the, the system could speak Swahili yes, or, or something like that so, and, and would, would have the same effect. Yeah, so, so it is a question of, of um, connection between the human users and the technical side of it. And that needs to be tailored. That means that's why we need training on the human side uh, understanding of the needs of psychology on a techie side. Yeah? So not just gung-ho enthusiasts that machine learning will solve everything. It's a brilliant method. But uh, as I said, big data uh, using machine learning will, need, will lead to big knowledge. Are we ready for big knowledge? Do we know what, what to do with it? How we store it? How we integrate it? How we transfer it? Yeah? So it's a big question. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, yes, Mikhail. Uh, so, uh, do I, uh, 
from your experience, uh, have you found this, uh, I don't know, golden standard? Uh, so to which extent you can use explanation to increase the diagnostic accuracy of the uh, system? Do you have the feeling how, how to use it uh, uh, accurately, say? Uh, well, it's a I got some feeling, yes, uh, but but uh, as I said, it, it it really depends from situation to situation. It's um it's not exactly AI, but I have seen I have seen um, uh, quite a bit of problems with uh, health information systems, where when the system was new, the users actually appreciated a lot of menus. Yes, uh, but once uh, they became more proficient uh, to use the system. The menus became a pain because I had to do six clicks to get to, uh, let's say, ordering of infusions in an ICU. And so, so that means that uh, that uh, to cope with that, uh, that system had a tricky function. At any time, if I knew the code of the target, yeah, so so I could actually type in the code at any time it, in the menu, and it will bring cut through the cut through the menu system and bring me straight away to to the function I wanted to. Yes, and people are animals of habit. Yes, so so uh, we actually learn our own codes and learn our own bits and pieces. So, and that's that's how that's how people who were using certain parts of the system frequently were using the codes. When they went to system parts of the system which they were using infrequently, they were using the support, the cognitive support, by clicking through the menus. And it's a and I assume it's the same thing with explanations. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. For you. Recollect, we are running out of the time, unfortunately, but let me give the last chance to Mrs. Garaeva to ask the question because the hand was raised. So the final question to Dr. Jan Stanis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Garaeva Isola from uh, the UCS from the Moscow. And I have that question. Well, we will talk about the target audience and what is the like a main clash uh, if we like uh, trying to is it will be like a uh, AA uh, to move on the unification way or it will be like a uh, diversification of the systems? How do you think how it will be in the future? I see definitely going it down diversification. Uh, the research which we've done in um, was not exactly AI in a sense I'm talking about now, yes, sir, but it was the tailoring system for diabetics. It showed that you, we took about uh, 30, 40 patients to test the, the system. Each of them had different needs. And uh, essentially the system interrogated them, assessed their knowledge and, uh, and answered the same question slightly differently depending on who asked. Yeah, so so on a, if, you, if you take a hospital system, yeah, so, so the same question asked by a physician uh, may get you different explanation than the same question asked by a nurse. Mm. And so because it's a different category and the job position is different, the, the job needs of the person are different. And, uh, and this diversification will, will go on, yeah, so. Yeah. Because people are yeah. different, yeah, so that means exactly. that if you teach, you, you teach okay. each student slightly differently. Yeah? So it's yeah, we academics, we don't handle our students one size fits all. Yeah. Let's hope at least. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jan, for such interesting session of this, uh, questions and answer. I see that uh, the number of questions is much bigger than is allowed. And uh, I think uh, people who didn't have a chance to ask uh, the questions personally will be able to send uh, the questions by email. You can type your email uh, to the chat and later people will be able to ask your question. Uh, now I can pass the ruling back to Professor Zussman for okay, continuing really. or closing uh, this first day of the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Eduard Bakkin. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanik, for an interesting, relevant presentation. Уважаемые коллеги, мне остается добавить, что последний пленарный доклад сегодняшнего дня состоится в Zoom в 20.00 по московскому времени. Докладчик профессор Эрик Маскин, лауреат Нобелевской премии по экономике. Спасибо огромное Фуаду Тагиевичу Арискерову, Мишелю Испанику и Яну Станоку за их глубокие доклады. Спасибо их слушателям. 
все, что сегодня происходило, происходило виртуально. И вместе с тем мы участвовали в реальном научном событии. Мы делаем перерыв до 13.30, а затем движемся по программе. It remains for me to add that the final plenary presentation of today will take place in Zoom at 8 p.m. Moscow time. The speaker, Eric Maskin, professor at Harvard University, recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics. Thanks to the distinguished speakers and their listeners, everything that happened today happened virtually, but at the same time, it was real. Now we go for a break until 1.30 p.m. See you soon. Thank you.